We are now turning towards uh, a session on the future of development cooperation. We ask ourselves, what is the future narrative or the narrative of the future within the field of development policy, as well as policy making and um, the fostering of international transregional corporations for sustainable development? So, narratives. What are the institutional um, requirements? How should the institutional landscape look like? And what are the concrete instruments to foster um, transregional cooperation on an equal eye level? So again, welcome. And I'm very much looking forward to discussing these questions with um, an, 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 an interesting panel. Um, we will have Professor Kremer, who is already with us, so I can see him, um, here giving us a short keynote, followed by a panel discussion with representatives from different fields, different world regions um, within the sector of development cooperation. So, Michael Kremer, I will turn over to you. Professor Kremer is the director and professor at the University of Chicago and of the Development Innovation Lab. And he holds a Nobel Prize from 2019 in economics. Mr. Kremer, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. So I'll speak from the perspective of a development economics researcher. In many fields, uh, from biology to computer science, some of the work researchers do is aimed at developing better understanding of the world, and some is aimed at developing specific practical innovations. And often there's an interplay between the two, with each contributing to the other. And economics is evolving in this direction as well. The objective of the Development Innovation Lab is to work together with governments and other organizations to help identify innovations which could potentially address development challenges which the governments and other organizations are facing. To pilot those ideas, rigorously test them, hone them, and then work together to adapt them and transition them to scale. Now, you know, we primarily work with governments, and I think this is something that often makes sense in development cooperation, partly because in the vast majority of countries, they're the most legitimate representatives of the population, but also for the very practical reason that they have the budgets, they have the infrastructure, the scale, and the mission to have the most development impact over the long run. Of course, I think there's also important roles for other partners, as I'll discuss. My personal experience, both as a researcher um, in the lab and from some work I've done as a funder of innovation with USAID's Development Innovations Ventures, is that the innovations which governments are most likely to sustainably scale are those which are first affordable, delivering high value for money, which are second administratively feasible and can be integrated into existing government systems, and third, that are at least eventually, in the right circumstances, uh, potentially politically acceptable to key stakeholders in society. Now, in some cases, those innovations will be developed within governments. In other cases, they might come from civil society, private firms, researchers, NGOs. But to be adopted by governments, they'll have to be adapted and modified. And going through that process of piloting and government practice, rigorously testing and refining, um, can both help develop rigorous quantitative evidence that policies can, policymakers can use to decide whether to move forward with the program, but they can also improve the program and fix problems. That's very abstract. Let me give an example. First, of some research that I've been involved in that isn't about a specific innovation or program. And then of an approach that the Kenyan government, Kenyan health researchers, and the lab I direct are hoping to conduct uh, to, to explore the potential of a, a specific innovation in government processes to promote child survival. As background, one of the greatest achievements in development in our century 
is the reduction in child mortality by more than half since 2000. Yet still, over 1.5 million people die from diarrheal disease each year, and more than 2 billion people lack access to safely managed water. Climate change and aquifer depletion threaten existing sources of clean water. So as a researcher, one aspect of, of our work is just to understand the potential impact on child survival. Now, perhaps surprisingly, this is an issue of considerable debate within the research community. And the reason is that mortality is thankfully a very rare outcome. And that means very large sample sizes are needed to measure child mortality in randomized trials, which the health community and, and medical researchers typically require uh, before believing there's strong evidence for an approach. And this feeds into, into policy as well. But while very large sample sizes are needed to measure mortality, there's typically limited funding available to study water treatment. So most studies have small sample sizes and can't measure mortality and just measure diarrhea as an outcome. I worked with a team of co-authors from a range of disciplines and from countries around the world to combine evidence from all the studies we could find um, in what's called a meta-analysis to get a large enough sample to detect effects on child mortality. And when we did that, we found that on average, Water treatment in low- and middle-income countries reduces mortality from all causes of children under five by about a quarter. It's a potentially huge impact on child survival. Now, that raises the question of moving from uh, sort of the pure research to innovation, whether there's a cost-effective way to provide water treatment that's administratively feasible, that's cost-effective, and that could be integrated into government systems. We're currently working uh, with the Kenyan government and Kenyan researchers to see if we can build on approaches that, you know, that have been developed by, by many uh, researchers over time and, by, and elaborated on by governments, by NGOs, to see if we can add a few tweaks to further innovate to help reach many more people in a cost-effective way. So one approach that has been tried is to socially market small bottles of water treatment that cost about 30 cents uh, for a month's supply. But if one of the most robust results to come out of development economics and behavioral economics is that even small fees can tremendously reduce usage of preventive health goods. And this approach typically has just you know, under, under single-digit uh, percentage take-up. Now, you could deliver this free to households, but delivering it to every household would be expensive. It wouldn't be targeted um, uh, to the households with young children that are most in need or to those who would necessarily use it. So we tried providing coupons for free water treatment solution to mothers in government clinics when they brought kids in for immunization, for example. And we found that virtually everyone who would use free treatment um, used uh, redeemed these coupons. And that allowed this, uh, the, the water treatment to be made available free to households, but at much lower cost by reducing waste of people who wouldn't have for people who wouldn't have used it anyway. When we combine the results from, from initial piloting with the results from meta-analysis, we see that approach could potentially be highly cost-effective. We estimate that spending about $40 on water treatment provides an extra year of life. So very comparable to immunizations, mosquito nets, the most highly cost-effective uh, health interventions. And it could be implemented with existing health systems. So we've been in discussions with senior government officials in Kenya, including Dr. Patrick Amath, the acting director general of the Ministry of Health, and for, for quite some, some time. And we've, we're now very actively exploring a large-scale pilot of the system within government systems in ways that would integrate with the normal operations of clinics. And with the idea of seeing if it's possible to measure impact and refine operations with a view towards scaling this up. 
also working with Kenyan medical researchers. Our current very rough ballpark estimate is that this approach could potentially save over 300,000 lives each year at a cost of, if, if scaled up internationally, at a cost of over a billion dollars annually. Now, this is an example of an approach that could potentially be scaled up by governments. Let me note that many organizations have an important role to play. Um, you know, I'm a researcher, so I think that includes researchers. But I'd also say that there's a very important role for N NGOs and civil society organizations, which piloted an early version of this approach, philanthropy, donors, and international organizations, such as the World Health Organization, which has shown a lot of interest in also exploring this approach. So I think uh, by, by working together and trying to find solutions that can be adopted by governments of low and middle income countries and working with them to with with those governments to to try these approaches to test them and refine them um, we can have a paradigm for potential development success thank you Thank you, Mr. Kremer, for this um, insight into your research, into reminding us of the relevance of scalable solutions and as well as also the, the contextualization of innovations, ne, economically speaking, just as much as politically speaking. Um, we will now take your keynote uh, into the panel discussion and I welcome next to Mr. Kremer, um, Andrea Ordonez the director of Southern Voice on the panel, and I hope Mrs. Ordonez can join us. I also welcome Ibrahim Hassam Mayaki, who is the um, chief executive officer of the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, as well as former prime minister of Niger. I welcome Mr. Vögele, who is the Vice President of Sustainable Development at the World Bank. And I welcome Mr. Sachin Chaturvedi, Professor Chaturvedi, who is a long-standing partner within the T20 um, context and uh, who is heading, who is a Professor of, of Development Economics um, and Director General at the Research and Information System for Developing Countries. Welcome, and uh, I very much appreciate um, you taking the time. It's an honor to be discussing with you. Currently, Mr. Kremer has left us. I'm not sure whether Mr. Kremer could join us again, please. And we will turn towards on the one side, of course, reflecting on the just heard keynote, as well as turning towards the three core questions of this panel. The core questions being, what is the narrative or the future narrative within the sector of development cooperation and development policy making? Which kind of institutional landscape is required? Um, and which are the instruments of of development uh, cooperation in the future. What do we know um, out of the beyond aid discussions that work in your different uh, work contexts and who are the actors in your perspective to take things forward? And I would invite now Mrs. Ordonez uh, to come in to first reflect on these questions out of your perspective. So we do around uh, around the table, so to say, um, with each of you. Ms. Ordonez. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me in, in, in this panel. And it was uh, very, very good to listen to the way of thinking uh, of uh, innovations also uh, for, for development. Um, and I think uh, it complements well with um, some of the initial remarks that I had planned. Um, the, the, around some of the lessons from uh, the COVID-19 crisis on development cooperation. And I think that one of um, the critical lessons that should um, guide this new narrative around development is that we um, really cannot uh, overlook uh, the importance of uh, locally based, uh, grassroots based organizations in the development agenda. And I think 
that um, you know we have seen um, over the years a little bit of a push towards more efficiency with the international cooperation that takes us to thinking about larger scale programs, scalability, as we've also heard. Um, but I think it's important to realize that they should not overlook the importance of the organizations in the grassroots level. And they have been really critical in the, resp- in the, in the social and economic response to, to COVID-19, even more so than other international non-for-profit organizations or other international uh, bodies. So uh, I think that we need to think of how development cooperation can uh, not crowd out these initiatives, but support them. Right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's a, a first initial um, uh, concept that I think it's important in the, in the, in the new narrative uh, for development cooperation. Uh, and uh, aligned with this, I think that um, you know, as, as, we, as we think about um, the, the next phase of of development cooperation and how it should evolve, uh, we should also be seeing as much as possible how um, development cooperation can be a co-invested uh, activity where um, ownership from um, the different beneficiaries of development cooperation that can take many shapes and forms are investing also in part of the solutions and ensuring that um, they are really aligned with the interests um, uh, of the places where we, uh, where we, where the de- different projects um, take place, mm-hmm. um, and later on I can come back to, to some of the, the arrangements. But I think we can I can start yeah. with that. Thank you, Andrea, for reminding us of the importance of um, locally embedded grassroots, uh, not just solutions innovations, but also the network, the, the ownership um, has to lie with with uh, local networks and the role of development cooperation in fostering and supporting um, those uh, initiatives that that already exist. Um, May I now invite Ms. Samayaki to come in, please. We can't hear you quite yet. Do you hear me now? Yes, we do, please. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I had a, a small comment on the issue of innovation because as a development agency of the African Union, we have a program called 100,000 Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises that we support through digital platforms uh, in order for them to have access to market uh, to be financially sustainable, have access to credit, etc. But the main characteristic of all these micro, small, and medium enterprises is they are, they are acting outside of a public space. They are not linked to governments. Mm-hmm. So you are faced with a, with a context where you have government-oriented policies, uh, the case of Kenya is a good one because they, they have, in a resolute manner, started to support startups, and but very few countries do it. So you have a two-speed society. Uh, 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 one which is under the intervention of, a, of, a, of a governments, which is public space, uh, where public policies do intervene, and the other one where you have all this uh, innovative capacity which doesn't rely on governments. So most of the development agencies, cooperation development agencies, are fundamentally working with governments. Mm -hmm. So they are working in system one, and they rarely know what system two is. And system two is where innovation takes place. Uh, and I think uh, uh, development cooperation needs to be revisited. Uh, and uh, these two actors, government and uh, development cooperation agencies, need to rethink the way they work together in a specific context by understanding better the context in which they are. Uh, the second point I wanted to allude to 
was that we, we respond as a development agency to demands and requests which are formulated by uh, member states. We have noticed in the last seven, eight years that most of these demands are not monosectoral. It's not about agricultural issues, transport issues, energy issues. They are multidimensional. So uh, when we work on a microgrid in Sierra Leone, it has to do also with education through provision of energy. Uh, it has to do with empowerment of small-scale farmers. So most of the demands are multi-sectoral. And the big problem that we have is that there is not enough uh, institutional innovation to tackle multi-sectorality. So uh, let me maybe stop here and uh, I can come back on the other questions related to the future narrative, the institutional landscape, instruments, and the beyond aid discussions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayaki, for, for this initial input, and we will get back to the um, additional points. Um, I would now invite um, Mr. Chatovedi for his input. Sachin, please. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. I think uh, we had an excellent uh, keynote today in terms of how we see innovation playing that role uh, in development. And uh, uh, um, uh, President Mayaki has very rightly pointed out the uh, institutional uh, innovations that are needed, institutional adaptions that are needed to absorb innovation uh, in the mainstream. And that, I think, uh, is extremely important. I would just like to make uh, uh, two points which are very important uh, uh, from the SDG perspective uh, uh, that we are looking into. And uh, uh, during the uh, Japanese presidency, uh, we launched a major initiative, uh, Japan-led initiative, in terms of how to leverage science, technology, innovation uh, for delivery of SDGs. And the focus was largely in terms of how do we address uh, uh, nutritional uh, deficiencies that are there, so SDG 2, uh, the health deficits, uh, SDG 3, uh, SDG 6, which is about water and sanitation, and SDG 7, which is about uh, the uh, energy uh, footprint, the carbon footprint to be reduced. So the, with these four goals, uh, uh, the uh, uh, initiative was launched and, uh, and the UN agencies are playing an important role. And, and as uh, I was uh, uh, hearing the keynote address, uh, uh, I, was, I was reminded uh, in terms of how some of the institutional innovations that uh, our President Mayake alluded to are important for us to create an ecosystem where what, what uh, our Professor Kramer said in terms of linking them up with the national requirement, national priorities. And these kind of linkages then would address not only the resource deficit, but also reorientation of, uh, of uh, institutional priorities, convergence with national budgetary allocations. Because it is important for us to realize that local resource mobilization, local ability uh, to absorb technological spillovers from one to the other sector, and its digitalization, which has come up in a major way, would help in terms of reducing the carbon footprint of our ability to bring in new technologies, but would also help in terms of reducing the burden, which is uh, extremely important uh, from finance point of view. I would come back uh, uh, with uh, further comments uh, uh, in the next rounds. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And Mr. Vögel. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, really wonderful to listen to this conversation. And I have to say, everything I've heard so far totally resonates with us. So what I'll do is I'll echo a number of the things and reinforce them uh, that we've heard over the past few minutes. First of all, Professor Kramer's uh, introduction and, <clears throat> and keynote speech uh, made a number of very, very important points. First of all, you've got to do your, your homework, your research. You've got to understand what actually works. And I think you made that point very forcefully. So I'm a great fan of creating continuous knowledge because things are not simple and they're not obvious sometimes. And sometimes what seems like a plausible solution turns out to be actually not practically feasible in the field. 
So that point that we have to fully understand before we push what we're doing is actually absolutely critical. Second point you made is you've got to build on existing structures and institutions and use everything you have at your disposal to help scale things up. It's never Development is never a linear process. You've got to have a government environment that allows you to do things, but who the main actor is, and that was that came out in some of the other comments as well, is very uh, situation-specific. And we are seeing in development very clearly that while in the past governments were the key actors and they're still critically important, if you don't have civil society on board, if you don't work with the media, if you don't work with you know, people uh, on the ground in the trenches, you cannot achieve anything. And I think we are very clearly learning that we need to shift our thinking from a linear approach to both on the process as well as, as the technical intervention to something that really brings everybody on board. And I think that is a little bit of a shift in the way we look at this. Secondly, I think more broadly, what we have done in the past was focused on economic development, focused on growth. And I think that has helped a lot. It has reduced poverty. It has got people in the school, et cetera, and, and health systems have improved. But it is by no means enough. And we're now reaching these tipping points. I think it's very obvious, right? If, if you don't do development that is sustainable, truly sustainable in the long run, you're not achieving anything. And things are going backwards, as we can see with the impact of climate change on, on many of the, the same uh, communities and, and countries that have been, we've been trying to support for, for so many years. So really understand what the implications are of what you do, not only what it is that you need to be doing, what the implications are. And then again, I come back to this, work with the people and build on the existing systems. Maybe one final point in the broader conversation. You know, every time we have a crisis, there are always calls for new uh, paradigm, for new institutions set up, a new fund for, to deal with the next crisis. I actually don't think that is the way to go about this. I think we should build on the existing instruments that we have and make them more nimble, make them more focused, make them more you know, people-centered and make them more think about the true sustainability of what we do. I think a further fragmentation of the aid architecture is not what will help us uh, deal with these issues. Uh, back to you. Thank you. Um, and I would like to now mirror to you, to the panel, as well as to the audience, what I've heard. Um, and would like to then open up the discussion also to, to the participants in the room, as well as, of course, uh, again back to you, to the panelists. Now, I've heard you implicitly say the Agenda 2030 continues to be the narrative that works also forward for the future of development cooperation. Now, I've also heard that you've mentioned but official development assistance in itself with, I think, last year 162 billion USD is not the model that is sufficient anymore to, for us to tackle the global challenges to tackle the, the challenges in the different uh, country and societal contexts. And it's also um, uh, restricting the, the abilities to create local ownership, to have civil societies and uh, local, basically local networks of actors in the driving seat. You've mentioned the importance of developing the institutional innovations in order to foster long-term change processes. And you've mentioned the, um, the focus on, on structural investments into structural changes, systemic changes towards assuring sustainable development processes, so long-lasting um, development processes. This is what I took away from you, and I would now invite the audience as well as, of course, the panelists, to come back in. Mr. Mayaki, you mentioned already you would like to come in on a few more points. Would you like to go ahead? Yes, I, I, I would like to come back on the issue of Agenda 2030. Uh, what do we see uh, from the position on which we are interacting with 50 governments is that... Um, a weakened multilateralism system has weakened Agenda 2030. Uh, the, we have the same intensity in motivating in, in terms of adapting national plan to the SDGs, but we sense a, a kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it fatigue, it's not the right term, but uh, um, um, skepticism. And this skepticism 
Um, in our view, in our view, well, we stand to be corrected evidently, is linked to a weakened uh, multilateralism. And what we also observe linked to that weakened multilateralism is a geopolitization of aid, of cooperation aid. And so the geopolitization of cooperation aid is, can be uh, looked at through two factors. The first one is that I'm from the Sahel region, you see. In, and I can look at the Sahel region, but I can look also at the, all of the Central Africa. Most of the resources which are supposedly dedicated to aid are uh, under the cover of security targets and military uh, uh, targets. So there is a, a, a shift in terms of the allocation of resources of aid and cooperation. And uh, within the context of a geopolitization of aid, uh, the, the way uh, the interactions are taking place between governments and uh, cooperation, uh, development cooperation agencies uh, has to be studied a bit further so that we can come to uh, some kind of uh, uh, um, conclusions uh, which can help uh, uh, improve uh, this type of, of interaction. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, which is a good thing, uh, the reliance on aid uh, is uh, still strong in certain regions of the continent, mm -hmm. which is the place uh, I where I have is limited knowledge, but uh, much less than in the other regions. Uh, a lot of efforts are being done in mobilizing domestic resources and increasing uh, uh, intelligently the fiscal pressure, because as you know, uh, Africa is the region which has the lowest fiscal pressure in the world. So many uh, instruments are geared towards uh, improving the mobilization of national revenue. And improving the national, re national revenue evidently is, has to be linked to questions of accountability, quality of governance, which is extremely, which is extremely important. And my last point on, uh, on the issue of, uh, of domestic resource mobilization is the illicit financial flows. I, I had the opportunity to co-chair a UN group on illicit financial flows. And uh, you know, we talk a lot about corruption, which is certainly important. But uh, what we realized and what everybody knows is that generally multinational corporations do not want to pay their taxes where they should pay them. And uh, most of the illicit financial flows in Africa uh, are uh, 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 made by uh, mining companies. So increasing our capacity to control the illicit financial flows will uh, have an impact on the, on the mobilization of national revenue. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we, um, well, the development uh, cooperation sector is a sector that is based on the internal logic, the logic of, of solidarity or principle of trans-regional solidarity. So while we got here together to reflect jointly on uh, the institutional landscape, the instruments, how they work, how they have or are reaching their limits. I think we all also agree that, um, especially in a, in a world as we envisage it, or as we observe it today, that we are the world that we are in today with its challenges, exactly this principle of transregional solidarity is key. So how do we develop this system further in order to live up to its promise? Mr. Vögel or Mr. Kremer, would you like to come in? I've seen your, your hand. Mr. Kremer oh, raised his hand, well, so please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful, thanks. I think, um, let me try to um, illustrate again with a, a particular example, but here let me take one, and I think I'll, I'll try to bring in some points which I probably gave short shrift to earlier, but the, which uh, other panelists have raised. Um, um, which is talking about the role of, of many, many different actors in this. So here's an example where I think the, the process that I outlined earlier 
has, has taken place and has successfully and sustainably scaled. This is a, a, another health intervention. This was developed by a very local organization. So the initial, you know, there, was, there, was, uh, there was some, you know, some, some work on it at, at international scales, but a local organization tried an approach in education um, of just treating children for worms. And was involved, I was involved with an evaluation of this approach. And we found very big gains initially in, in, in education, people completing school. Ultimately, we found gains in income. Because we had that, uh, that rigorous evidence, the local organization um, and this very small organization, together with the research evidence, together with the cooperation of, of international organizations, uh, the World Bank, uh, um, and, and, uh, and uh, we're able to approach the government, present this evidence to them. The government of Kenya then, um, then there was a, an intense period of work to adapt this to their system, but they eventually adopted, the, adopted this program nationally, scaled it up, and then together with assistance from other uh, international organizations, the World Health Organization and the World Bank again, this was transmitted to Indian state governments, which then followed this approach. And then eventually the Indian national government uh, took this approach of school-based deworming. And now hundreds of millions of, of children uh, uh, worldwide are, 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 being, uh, are being dewormed through school-based deworming. This is, um, and you know, other countries followed followed suit. So I think this is that's an example with uh, you know local uh, organizations um, developing something that could eventually be adapted by governments. But there was a big role for international multilateral cooperation on this, in part because the developing these ideas, testing them, that's a global public good that doesn't just benefit one country, but can then go on to benefit many countries. So I think there's a very important role uh, for multilateral cooperation in, in, in developing these innovations, helping transmit them, helping support governments that want to want to try them out. I think there, there, there are many, you know, many other examples of this as well. I haven't talked about the private sector, but there are also you know, those 100,000 firms I completely agree. They're a very important source of innovation as well. But I've taken more than my my time here, and uh, I, I won't give some. Ex there are plenty of examples of things taking off from firms and then spreading. Mm. As Thank well. you. Thank you, Professor Kremer. And I saw Andrea Ordonez raise her hand, and then we have a hand from the chat. Andrea. Thank you. And Mr. Fugler. Um, yeah. I was going to add a second principle to your solidarity principle. I think that the second one is around trust. And I think um, Professor Kramer has made a great um, mm. point about um, the role of international cooperation in facilitating knowledge. And, um, and that's an important role uh, for, for development cooperation. But I think, and this is moving towards the uh, thinking about what we could start doing differently. One of the things that we have right now is uh, organizations either in the global north or within the the international system, finding solutions and then finding where they are needed. And I think uh, if we are moving into a system of multilateral uh, cooperation that is uh, also guided by uh, trust, we should start giving more trust to the local communities to identify the challenges that they need and then look out for possible partners and solutions uh, within the international system Uh, to support the, their, their particular needs. And I think that um, thinking this way of how can we uh, make the decisions and the choices of what are the problems and what are the solutions that are wanted in different contexts uh, is very important in a new paradigm for development cooperation. And that is why I'm adding this additional principle to yours of solidarity, of trust, of trusting those beneficiaries, of trusting the communities um, that uh, want to be supported uh, with some of the decision making around uh, where they want to go. Mm. Thank you, Andrea. That's a very important, um, uh, important additional principle. Um, I fully agree. Now, Mr. Vögele uh, and Mr. Satu, um, uh, Sachin, um, I would now like to take two hands from the floor and then hand over back to you 
uh, for a second second intervention. Um, please. This uh, question is from Niels Handler, who is following, uh, following online and who is also one of this year's Young Global Changers from the Global Solutions Initiative. And he asks, Professor Kramer, will the future of development cooperation will be more evidence-based? How much more effective could, e.g., German development cooperation become if guided by a chief scientific advisor? Thanks. And we take, we take a second one and... Um we collect yeah? uh. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Gina Cortez Valerrama. I come from Colombia and I'm the Young Global Changer Ambassador for Latin America. And I find really interesting this discussion around development cooperation and I have heard some principles on solidarity as well as on trust. Um, I think that regarding the region where I come from, I would like to listen which are your thoughts in terms of reparations uh, as a way of coming from all the colonial and extractive activities that have been embedded in our countries for the development model that is currently still taking place, but whose ideology that is still very, um, yeah, very strong in our society is continue and exacerbating different inequalities. So I do believe that we need solidarity, but I do believe that we need to talk about reparations. For example, if you go back to the Paris Agreement, you're going to see clearly stated uh, the common but differentiated responsibilities to climate change, which I think that comes uh, in relation with all this work about cooperation. And for instance, when we talk about grassroots organizations and how they can uh, 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 take advantage of the support of this cooperation. For example, women, grassroots women, indigenous people, Afro-descendants face a lot of different limitations accessing to those funding due to the systemic way in which these funding proposals need to be written or presented. So I would like to hear a little bit more about your reflections on that. Thank you. Thank you. We take one third and then we have to already uh, come to an end and we do that by handing over to um, the Great. panel once more. Greetings. So, brief. <laughs> yes, it's brief. Uh, my name is Fiora Alba. I am from Albania and I work with, in the Ministry of Health and Social Protection for people with, with disabilities. Um, you talk a lot about uh, multilateralism, how to implement that, how to extend that, especially it's a huge challenge for the uh, countries which are, which are low incomes, you know, low economies. My question is, um, how, how do you reflect to implement multilateralism in these countries which act, they, they are attracted with multilateralism, but at the end they are unilateral in doing things? Thank you. And... Um I would like to hand over to Yumisa Fögle and Satin Chatovedi. I have to unfortunately, with a view onto the time, ask you to be brief. I apologize if you cannot answer all questions, but this is a continued discussion that we will also continue in a number of additional settings. Mr. Fögle. Thank you. Each one of those questions deserves an hour conversation. We've raised a lot of important things in the last half hour that we need to go a lot deeper to really have a satisfactory outcome. You know, but in a world of fragmentation, as, as Professor Kramer said, multilateralism actually is really helpful. Let me, let me tell you, in, in, in the World Bank, we have every country represented and we have everyday conversations around how do we continue to be supportive to, to our clients? How do we engage in a world where there is political fragmentation, where at the technical, social, environmental level can we come together and make progress on child mortality issues and health issues and education issues? on climate change, you know, and keeping the politics out to, to the extent possible. So you will be surprised how much actually consensus there is uh, in, in, in a very fragmented political environment, even between countries that normally politically don't see eye to eye. So I think there is a process that's very important. Couldn't agree more with Andrea, it's got to be about trust. And we, all of us are learning, we, we've all on a trajectory for moving from top down to bottom up. You cannot at the end of the day work 
and, and try to implement something if the people don't trust it and if they're not with it and if they don't support it. And so our way of approaching these things is fundamentally changed uh, over the last few years and is continuing to change. So I just wanted to make um, these these two key points um, mm. uh, at this point. I have lots more ideas uh, that, that I want to refer to. Ma- Mr. Mayaki raised a number of very, very complicated issues, mm. obviously, that need to be looked at. Yeah. Remittances flows, the whole, the whole issue of, of illicit uh, money flows uh, impact very, very severely. But there is one point, and I think you mentioned the government's um, spending and the government's fiscal space. You know, there is in many countries that I worked in, I always, the first reaction is always there more money coming. And then the second conversation we're having is what are you actually doing with the money you have right now? And that gets me to the subsidy point, right? I mean, you look at how countries waste money at the moment, and that is across the board, not just developing countries. Billions and billions, and, and agriculture subsidies alone in the world right now are $650 billion per year. That's three quarters of a trillion dollars per year, and very little of that. Very is little that, of that is helpful for climate, for, for, for nature, for, for, the, for the social impact. And so having this conversation about repurposing that is actually key, not mm, cutting it, because mm. you need to support your farmers, but repurposing it to get a, a double and triple win is the key. Mr. Vögel, I apologize that I have to interrupt. We are sort of kicked out of the different rooms, the virtual as well as the physical. I would like to give uh, Sachin Chaturvedi the last word And thank you all uh, for your understanding. I, I very much understand the time constraint. I see the screen watch, which is saying all zeros. We have lost all time. I would just be very precise with a uh, uh, half a second point, And I think uh, re-emphasizing uh, what we have heard uh, just uh, I think in one line is the idea of uh, localization of development, the Agenda 2030. And I think uh, technology, innovation, uh, knowledge, the future of development cooperation would be led by knowledge. It would be led by technology. And Mm -hmm. that localization is extremely important. Given the kind of externalities that we are ending up with, be that the Ukraine crisis, the rise in numbers of refugees, or or even the uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdowns and their spillover effects on our GDPs and, and uh, industrial production, the squeeze in the development finance. I think uh, uh, new and innovative ways of sharing knowledge and technology with localization would be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. I think it became very obvious that this is only the start of a conversation, a conversation that we will continue in different settings um, over the coming months, years. I very much thank Mr. Kremer, I thank the panel, I thank the audience for this um, starter of the conversation uh, and wish you all a good afternoon, good evening, good morning. My name is Anna-Katharina Hornitsch. I'm the director of the German Development Institute. Thank you for joining us. 